Yes, I just want to just want to check out. Shit. You know, I wrote it backwards because I thought it would it would be like a mirror, but now I got to write it. <laughs> I got you covered, Bill. Look at that. Oh yeah, well, that's even better. <laughs> Right, it took it took about twenty minutes to figure out how to do all that backwards too. It's just, uh, I got you covered. We are live. We've got a couple people on here now. We'll let people get on in the room. The Sergeant Hart here with Bill Mosley. Y'all might know him from a few movies out there. If you're Born watching, legend. Share it up. Share it up. Now, Bill, I got a serious question for you that I've been dying to ask you. Okay. Dude, I'm dead serious. We, uh, we need to address this elephant in the room. You went to Yale. Yeah. Are you a member of the Skull and Bones Secret Society? If I were, I would have to get up and leave the room when you mentioned it. But I got to tell you, my dad was a member. Wow. And sometimes just a freak him out, we would say, skull and bones, skull and bones, and he'd have to leave the room, which was a good way to get rid of him. But uh, no, I was not a skull and bones guy. There's some powerful people in that thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, George Bush. There's a bunch of, uh, you know, yeah, powerful people. Actually, George Bush Sr. was my uncle's roommate at Yale. So, we have a family history that goes back to my grandfather. My father's father was uh, a Yaley. Uh, he was actually an All-American end on the football team. And then my dad was an All-American center captain of the team. And um, I sold hot dogs at Yale Bowl. So I think the, the buck got stopped here. <laughs> Now, did they get caught up? Because probably during that period, they were recruiting at Yale with the OSS. Um, you know, they for all you know, they could have been recruited into the OSS and helped with the uh, with the establishment of the Central Intelligence Agency. I love that movie, The Good Shepherd. If anybody haven't watched that, I haven't seen it, but uh, I don't know. My my dad could have been in the OSS. I have no idea. I know he did. Uh, he was in World War II, and he re-upped for Korea. Uh, and in both wars, he flew. Wow. Uh, he flew a Corsair in World War II in the wow. Pacific Theater. And then in uh, Korea, he, he flew a uh, Banshee with one of the jets. But he was not a fighter pilot. He was a photo recon guy. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That was back when they would actually, when they would fly, they would actually take the the reconnaissance pictures with film and they wouldn't be able to review it until like a day after they flew their mission yeah and, and the other thing is because i like intelligence stuff because i like to pretend i'm intelligent sometimes uh but that's what i did in the marines is when they flew they had those flight jackets and inside the flight jacket there would be a silk patch and it had a map that was silk. And they used to have chips on those maps where if they got shot down, they could give that chip to somebody and and that person would get rewarded by the US for helping the down pilot. Wow. I, I have my dad's flight jacket, but I haven't seen any uh, silk anything silk sewn in the inside of it. But it's you know, it's 70 years old, so I don't know. It's in the closet, actually. You want me to go get it? No, nah, nah, we'll, we'll yeah. Oh, he's going to wow, get it. Wow, he's going to get it. <laughs> I stole my dad's flight jacket for when, when I was all punk rock, and it got all screwed up, and my dad smacked me around for it. But it was a badass jacket. It had fur around the collar. It's all brown leather. And he told me that the, the pocket inside there was for his browning 9 millimeter. Oh. Yep, that's it. Yeah, wow. 77. Yeah, I think it was the, the Kearsarge was his aircraft carrier. Oh, man. And uh, let's see here. There's his, there's his tag. Uh, Spencer D. Mosley, Captain USMC, Marine. Marine? Yep. Believe it, or not, 
That's the Korea patch. You can see that it's uh, that's a rising sun. It's a bird sitting on the world. Wow! See that at all? That's amazing. Badass. Yeah. 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 Did he have a did he have a Marine Corps tattoo? Because I don't know if they would have let pilots have tattoos back then. I don't remember seeing any tattoos on Dad. You know, that's a, those yeah. guys are, are uh, just I could not comprehend what they went through in World War One and Two and Korean War. Uh, because you hear the stories. If you ever get a chance, HBO has a series called The Pacific. Ooh. And it tells the stories of, you know, legendary people in the Marine Corps during the Highland Hopping campaign uh, in the Pacific. And you got like the story of Chesty Puller. Uh, you have, you know, the story of Ira Hayes. I mean, it would, the Battle of Iwo Jima. It, it's, it's amazing. I do know that one of my dads, uh, I think it was in Korea, his, one of his superior officers was Ted Williams, the baseball player. So uh, I think that was either, I think that was Korea, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was tough. I, I didn't really get in. He didn't really want to go into a lot of stories. It was interesting because he never flew again after Korea. You know, a lot of those guys were pilots. They, you know, they got their own planes or took weekend flights on Cessnas. Never flew again, um, but uh, I certainly understood the marine side of it because I grew up, um, you know, having to jump down and give him ten. And <laughs> when we uh, when we made our beds, uh, he would come along and and uh, try to flip a quarter. He'd flip a quarter, and if the quarter didn't bounce, you know, you had to do it over again. Um, we were, you know, I grew up in Illinois, and when we were uh, in the middle of winter. Uh, you know, we'd have to take showers before I had two brothers, one older, one younger. We had to take showers before we went to school. And uh, dad would always stick his hand in and turn the hot water off. <laughs> so it was like, you know, so I have, um, you know, I mercifully, I have two daughters. And so <laughs> and those are those are some of the some of the, you know, hard rules of life. I, I was mercifully not able to pass on. <laughs> And we got some people in here watching. Everybody watching, if you guys will share this, invite your friends to watch it. Uh, Clint says, yo, Bill. Yo. What's going on, Clint? Am I, am I looking into camera right now if I look at the little green dot on top of my – am I looking into, into your eyes right now? Okay. Yeah. So look at the green dot. All right. Hey, Clint, how's it going, man? Michael says, what's up? Yo. Bill, were you ever in any military films? I was trying to remember if you were. Did you ever do anything like where you were in the military? Not that I can remember. I'm sure you know there might be uh, some some good fans out there that could that could school me, but uh, I don't think so. Scott Perry says hello. Hey, Scott, long time. I remember uh, when we were doing the shootout at the Firefly Ranch. I told you, hey, take. Take the magazine out and slam it against your helmet. And you're like, oh, okay. And I was all excited. Yeah, thanks. No, I appreciate that. And that was badass. That was such a great scene. I love that. I love that. I, I loved everything from House of a Thousand Corpses to um, just uh, all those Rob Zombie films that you were in. I did. Uh, I also had, I worked on Halloween with you. I don't know if you remember that. But, uh, yes. yes. Uh, um, I, I, I loved, uh, I just, I just love that character. It just, you know, I, I mean, my favorite character is Chop Top, but I loved your character in in, in House of a Thousand Corpses and uh, Devil's Rejects. I just loved it. Such a strong, oh, yes. great. I mean, it, it puts you as like in the top of the ring of like crazy psycho murderers, and you're so good in it. I love it. <laughs> hey, I'm a big fan. Hey, Mark, if you, if you get a chance, check out Bill's film, The Graves. It's him and a couple of young, nice looking young lady. And they really? got a scene in the, in the, in the schoolhouse where he kind of looks normal and then he just turns on the crazy. I mean, how do we just turn, turn with, the crazy? With the, pig, with the pig nose. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's one of your <laughs> – it's got to be one of your faves. <laughs> I love that. I Actually, because in the graves, I, I had a friend of mine who was I was running lines with. He's an actor studio guy. 
And I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking, thinking about the character. And he said, well, what animal are you? And usually I don't think along those lines. Some, some actors do, and maybe it works for them. But I just thought that, that sounded kind of weird. And he, he said, no, really, what animal are you? And I said, I'm a pig. And he goes, well, there you go. <laughs> and uh, that immediately, I thought, well, shit. Then I should get a, I should get a like a plastic pig snout. And uh, so that's what I wore in the grapes. I wore that plastic pig snout, kind of sniffing, chasing the girls, <laughs> sniffing, running around. I remember we shot that actually in uh, Wickenburg, Arizona, at a, at a deserted mine. Wow. It was, it was a whole property with a bunch of buildings, dilapidated buildings. And at one point, I was hiding in one of the dilapidated buildings. And that was right around the time of, uh, uh, I think it's called the Hanta virus, speaking of COVID and all that stuff. And the Hanta virus was uh, in the tri, you know, it was like Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it, was, it was found in the droppings of uh, rats and mice. And yeah. I, I'm in this cabin, I'm hiding. And, uh, and I'm looking down and I, I'm, I'm like literally in a pile of um, <laughs> mouse shit. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh man. Ah, Jeez. the glamor of Hollywood. Here comes the hantavirus. <laughs> uh, I didn't get it though. That was good. Liz says pigs are people too. That's yeah, a story right. about real. And we have some people commenting that they, went, they have met you in person at a convention but did not get a signed picture. Now, if you guys did not get a signed picture for Bill or you want to support Bill for all the work he's done with the horror community and taking the time, go to his website, which I posted right here, the Chop Tops Barbecue, bbq.com, and you can get pictures. If, you, if you've ever wanted a Bill Mosley uh, DVD, CD, it's on there. You, you know what I have that's one of my prized possessions? Is I have the the chrome skull, the you know from chopped up. I have you, you sign one of those for me. Nice. I love that piece. That's a great piece. I love that. Um, you know, I actually have the original. And while you you know say nice things about me, I'll go get it. It's right in the closet. Like all my stuff is in my closet. So here I go. <laughs> Holy cow, folks! We're gonna see the original chrome top for chopped top. <laughs> I bet you he still got the original. Coat hanger too. What? Uh, I do have the original coat hanger. That that requires another another trip. It's in this box. Oh, top top box. Um, about uh, 10, 15 years ago, I got a uh, an email from some guy in Seattle saying, "How much would you give me for your head plate for your chop top head plate?" And I knew that only two were made. One was kind of a before. Uh, Leatherface hits me in the head with the chainsaw and one is after. So there's like a smooth plate and then a scored <laughs> plate. And um, and I knew that the one person that had it was Tom Savini because, you know, he created the Chop Top makeup. So he had one of the plates. The other plate was the head makeup guy, Sean McEnroe, who lived in Seattle and uh, whom I hadn't heard from and, you know, got to be 15, 20 years at that point. And um, and I, I responded to this guy. I didn't know who it was, and I said, "What do you, what, what do you know? What, what, what about the plate?" Well, he identified himself as a neighbor of Sean's and said that Sean was like had given him a bunch of stuff to sell, and that uh, Sean had said, "Why don't you talk to Bill first because he might want it since it was on his head." And uh, so the guy contacted me and said, "How much, you know, will you give me for it?" And uh, I called a friend of mine, Todd Bates, a uh, makeup guy here in town who's since gone to his great reward. And I said, uh, you know, how, much, how much should I offer the guy? And Todd said, you know, I would offer him um, $1,500. I just went, wow, that's insane. And, uh, and he said, you know, because because the, the, the downside was that if I offered him too little, he'd say, forget it. I'm going to put it up on eBay. And if it were on eBay, I would then, you know, it would be a bidding war. And that's a right. pretty important piece of horror history. So I was a little worried about it. So I said to the guy, 1500 bucks. I, I took Todd's advice. And the guy said, OK, how, how are we going to do the exchange? 
Well, it turns out that um, the uh, one of the artists for a, a bunch of uh, corn bugs, my old band with Buckethead, a lot of the artwork was done by a guy named Brian Theus, AKA Frankensus, who lived in Seattle, which probably still does. And, um, and so I made him my second. And uh, it, I, I sent this uh, money order for 1500 bucks to Brian. Brian showed up at a designated Starbucks the uh, the guy shows up with this box, and uh, and they do this you know probably have a little latte and then they did their exchange you know they sure. wanted to make sure you know each one wanted to make sure that the other one had the right goods, and uh, and Brian you know I told him what to look for and he said it was the real one so then he um, you know uh, UPS this box down to me in Los Angeles and I got it and. Um, I opened it up, and the first thing I found was uh, from Brian was this little note. <laughs> you can see, you can see, there's a little, you know, <laughs> you know. So he he gave me his little his little his little note, and then uh, I dug further in the box, and here is the original chop top head plate. And you can see, wow. I, I knew that it had a notch up here. That was that was the important, you know, that that told me that it was a real deal. Plus, That's wonderful. As you That's can wonderful see, that you have it. Oh yeah, and this plate, you can see, this is the scoring where where Leatherface hits me in the head with the chainsaw right along here. That's great. And what's interesting about it, it's very thin, and it's made of sterling silver. Wow. Wow. Uh, the money in that. And Tom Savini said that they use sterling silver because it's very malleable, meaning you can bend it and like, not get a crack. And uh, it's thin, so you know it's strong, so you don't really have to have a big thick plate on the head. So I got the plate, and uh, it's you a should. great story. I'm, I'm very glad I have it. That's badass. That is cool. I get fifteen hundred dollars for it. Yeah. Yeah. Probably <laughs> now. I know. Now it's now probably a little more than that. Did did Tom Savini know you when you did uh, Night of the Living Dead? Yes, that's why he hired me. He hired me because we became great friends uh, thanks to Texas Chainsaw too. Um, oh, well, I spent I, a lot of time in that makeup chair in what we what I called the House of Pain, and uh, with with Sean McEnroe, Mitch Devane, uh, Gino Crognali. Uh, John Vulich, uh, there were a lot of a lot of you know great guys. Gabe Bartalos, there was a real kind of a who's who back then of you know young up and coming makeup guys who uh, were totally you know they followed. They were they were Tom Savini's merry pranksters, wow. and um, I became great friends with all of them. Love them all to this day. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, thought I thought Not a Living, living Dead came, came out before, out before uh, uh, Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No, it came out right after. And, and in oh. fact, it was funny. I got a call from Tom one day, um, obviously after Paint Chainsaw 2, and he said, hey, it looks like I'm directing a, a remake of Night of the Living Dead, and um, I want to send you a script. And so, and then just, you know, read through it, and I want you to pick any character you want to play. So I went, great. So he sent me the script back in those days, pre-internet, so it came in the mail, and it was like a real paper script, and I read the whole thing, and I wanted to play Harry, the, the bad guy in the basement. Oh, because yeah, yeah. Speaking like a practical actor, uh, Harry had a bigger part. Yeah. And like, you know, it was, that was, was the biggest part that I could probably qualify for. And so I said to Tom, I called him up and said, that's ah, a great script, wonderful, uh, I want to play Harry. And he said, oh yeah, any part, uh, just make sure it's Johnny. I was like, because eh. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, I mean, that's like, you know, maybe a week at most. But, you know, so that was that was my thinking was it wasn't artistic. I'm sorry. It was basically practical and, and earning uh, an earning perspective. But so, you rocked it. You rocked it. You rocked well, the iconic line. Everything. You know, I, I, you know, love Russ Striner. I love the movie Night of the Living Dead. I love George's Night of the Living Dead. I think it's it's still one of my, you know, favorite horror movies of all times really you know made a big difference in my life 
uh, as did Chainsaw, you know, a bunch of other ones, you know, Evil Dead 2. There's a bunch of real signature films for me. Um, but um, what I wanted to do is I really wanted to make sure that I got um, uh, the Boris Karloff accent down. So what I did was I rented this movie from my local video store. That's right. There was this thing called Videotape back in the last millennium, kids. And uh, and it was a movie called Die, Monster, Die. Oh, which classic. Was the final, Great Boris yeah, one, of, one of Boris's final ones. It was starred Nick Adams, The Rebel, and... Um, great H.P. Lovecraft story. And uh, and that's what I used to study. And so I studied and studied and studied that Boris Karloff accent so that I was able to say, they're coming to get you, Barbara. That's wonderful. And because we had a long walk from the car to our mother's grave and there wasn't anything scripted, I ad-libbed a line which is, they're horny, Barbara. <laughs> They've been dead a long time. <laughs> Stop it, Johnny, because she was such a prude at the beginning. And then by the end, of course, she's fucking Sigourney Weaver and Alien, you know. I mean, yeah, she, she was Weaver. badass. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a we, scene in Night of Living Dead when at the very end when she's rushing out of the house and she sees the, the bride woman and she goes to kill her. And just she can't. It's just too heartbreaking for her. And that's such a great moment in that movie. I love that yeah. scene. Well, I had an idea which I which I communicated to Tom, and I said, you know, because um, I don't think Johnny didn't die very gloriously in uh, in the screen the screenplay, and so I said, well, here here's an idea that I have, Tom. How about uh, you know Johnny? You know, I'm I'm, I'm dead. I, I come back. I'm walking around, um, and he, my my idea is that Johnny somehow you know slips into the house. And he's walking across the living room and there's Barbara's like looking and seeing her brother. And she's like, Johnny. And, and I just keep coming because I'm about to bite her. And uh, she's paralyzed because it's her brother. And, uh, and Tony Todd, you know, comes in, sees me and casually lops off my head with a machete. Uh, my head then falls and rolls on the floor. She goes, Johnny. And, and just in, my, in that last second, you know, I look up and my eyes open. Oh, that's kind wonderful. Like, I remember at the end of the guillotine and the French Revolution, apparently, you know, the heads were still alive for like a second or two after they'd been detached from the body. And I thought there would be a moment there where you couldn't really tell, did Johnny come back or was that just a, you know, reflex? And I, I said that to Tom and he said, he said, you know, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful idea. We don't have the budget. <laughs> <laughs> so I just ended up coming back as like they, they actually I didn't come back. Uh, they my uh, my rubber my dummy came back and you could see it in the back of a pickup truck under a tarpaulin. <laughs> so, but you know, great ideas. Not all of them make it to the big screen. <laughs> uh, we got a question from Mosley Mitchell. He wants to know, Bill, are there were some roles you'd like to play that you haven't, and are there some directors crossing my fingers? uh you'd like to work with um you know I, i'm sure there are roles out there that i would love to play that i just really don't know about i don't i don't lie back and dream about any roles in particular um but i did see on that uh that question uh uh for instance are there directors like uh uh ari aster and panos cosmopolis Cos cosmatos and um, I've met Panos. I met him at the after party for the premiere of Three from Hell. Great guy. And he's worked with Richard Brake. And has. And uh, I met him. Richard introduced us. And I, I love Mandy. And, uh, and uh, so I would love to work with Panos. And, and Panos, you know, said nice things about me. So I'm hoping that that works. Uh, I just thought, I thought Midsummer was fucking awesome. I really did. I thought it was fantastic. Really blew my mind. And uh, so, of course, anything that Ari Aster would do, I would love to do. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of questions. Uh, Angela wants to know, what's your favorite film you've worked on? You know, it's kind of like asking, which is your favorite children, if you have more than one? And, um, you know, that you may have a favorite child, <laughs> but you better not tell the others, uh, especially if they're responsible for your nursing home. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I like them all. I, I get something out of every job I do. Um, you know, certainly, you know, a paycheck. And I mean, you know, to me, it's like, you know, it starts out with, um, you know, the check clears and I don't get hurt. So that's, those are kind of the two, those are the, the foundational issues of, uh, you know, of working as a professional actor. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, certainly Devil's Rejects was, uh, was so it was, I don't really know if it was a fun job. I mean, we worked our butts off as, uh, you know, we, we all know that, uh, you know, that uh, you know, movie making, if it looks easy on screen, you know that, you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it to make it look easy. Um, I, but I, I, I enjoy just about every job because there's always, you know, it's almost like doing a different crossword puzzle. Uh, you know, there's always some, there's some, something specific about that job that is a challenge uh, that you, uh, you know, you have to unlock in your head. Uh, there's always a different bunch of people, different personalities, different characters, scenes, motivations, uh, different locations. There's always so much going on that I, I don't really have. I mean, I have a favorite, you know, I'd say Devil's Rejects, um, you know, it's one of my faves uh, just because, you know, thank God, whew, you know, we did it. And uh, it's one of those rare movies that really is... Um, I don't know. For me, it might be a little, it might be hyperbole, but I, I think it's a perfect movie. You know, oh, I yeah. think everything about it works, and that's that's the greatness of of movie making. You know, it's when your casting works, the script, the locations, you know, the the makeups, everything about it, the soundtrack, amazing. Everything yeah. about it just seemed to to work, and uh, the editing, of course, Glenn Garland, you know, who managed to put all that together. Rob's vision, uh, you know, the Phil Parment, uh, the, the DP who was, you know, and the grain of film that they used. I mean, everything was a choice and uh, really just came out uh, incredibly well. So I'd have to say that certainly I, I'm, I'm maybe proudest of that. Now, uh, Liz wants to know, do you have a favorite character you played? Yeah, it's another one of those uh, don't tell the other kids. <laughs> uh, uh, but, um, I, you know, it's, I, I would have to say Chop Top. You know, I just I just love Chop Top so much. Um, my Sonny Bono. Eh? Yeah, that's right. Dog will hunt. Get that bitch. God, I love it. Always there, man. Chop Top is never too far. Uh, and I do. I just love Chop Top. I love everything about it. I love you know, it was my first love too. So in all of our romantic histories, you know, our first love is, you know, cuts the deepest or whatever. Um, you know, for me, it was like, uh, you know, winning the lottery, uh, running away and joining the circus and then, you know, saying, hey, here's the we got a, we've got a little trailer for you here. <laughs> you can stay. Uh, everything was about so it was so much fun. Uh, Toby Hooper loved what I was doing and, and uh, really was uh, very encouraging on uh, for uh, for improv, I mean, you know, I ended up probably improvising, I don't know, 30, maybe 30 percent of my lines, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so like lick my plate, you dog dick. I don't know where that came from. That no. What about enough. incoming mail? Was that uh, yours? Uh, that was mine, too, because wow. I'm, I'm a big fan of Sergeant Rock comics. And oh, uh, that's wonderful. Remember that Sergeant Rock, the uh, Army comics, comic books? And he would say, incoming mail. And that would be like, you know, enemy, you know, mortar fire would come in. Wonderful. Or something. <laughs> and I was, you know, I'm, I'm a nom vet, you know, job top. So, yeah. Jake, yeah. No, how did how did you meet Rob Zombie? He's dying to know. <coughs> Don't die, man. Uh, well, let's see. I was asked by uh, my buddy, Elliot Secular, who at the time, back in 1999, um, he was the head of publicity for Universal City Walk here in Los Angeles. Wow. And like a City Walk, it's kind of like Universal Studios and it's lots of stores and it's, you know rides and different things, kind of like the Disneyland of Universal Pictures. And uh, they were doing this new little award show. I think it had already been going on for a couple of years, but their MC had dropped out. And it was a little horror award show called the Igor Awards, E-Y-E-G-O-R-E. -E -E. And um, 
and they needed an MC. And this, my buddy that I knew socially uh, called up and said, you're a horror guy, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, uh, would you like to MC this horror show? And I said, I said, well, and he said, yeah, I mean, we can pay you. And I was like, yeah, sure, all right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was desperate, of course, then, as usual, a lot of actors are. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, well, would you like me to do it as Chop Top? Because Chop Top is my, you know, my, my signature character. Hell yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, Chop Top is, it's not a universal character. Let me, let me find out. So he went and he talked to his people and, and they said, well, Bill was in um, Army of Darkness. So he is part of the universal family, quote unquote. So yes, he can do Chop Top. So I ended up, um, I got some extra money in the budget to hire my buddy, Todd Bates, who could do uh, the Chop Top makeup because we had worked together on All-American Massacre, the great mysterious All-American Massacre. And um, so I called him up and he came and made me up as Chop Top. Um, I wore a, like a ratty tuxedo in a mine. And um, and I emceed this horror award show. And one of the award recipients, and it was a little outdoors, cheesy outdoors, bunch of folding chairs and a you know makeshift stage. But one of the award recipients was Rob Zombie, and uh, because it was basically Universal kind of awarding things to its own people, so there was uh, the Mummy. Um, uh, with, uh, what is it, Brendan Brand Fraser. 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 Yes, yeah, all yeah, those yeah. guys were getting awards. Uh, Lupita Tovar got an award. She was she was the ingenue in the Spanish language Dracula, which would shoot at night when the Bela Lugosi Dracula was shooting at right right. Universal. And Lupita was still around, very cool, gave her an award. And finally, it's time to uh, introduce Rob Zombie. Well, at, my, at that time, my, my older daughter was about 13, 14 years old. She was a big Rob Zombie Hellbelly Deluxe fan. She was her butthead, the whole deal. And, um, and so she came along with her little friend, Jacqueline. And this was going to be big daddy points. You know, they could meet Rob Zombie. And uh, I didn't really know much about Rob. And I, I introduced him. And I, I did the whole thing, of course, in character as Chop Top. And I introduced Rob, and he came out. And, uh, and he looked at me and then he looked at the crowd and he took the mic and he said, if you had told me that the real Chop Top was emceeing this show, I would have said you were crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I don't know what I thought, but anyway, I met him, you know, at the end of, after, after the show, there was a little green room and talked to Rob and his then girlfriend, now wife, Sherry, and his mom and dad were there. Wow, because wow. even though he had a lot of Grammy nominations, he'd never won anything. So his little demon statue was the first award he'd ever won, um, wow. from what I what I recall. And uh, and so uh, you know we had a nice chat, and you know he freaked out. He he said, you know, when I was in the green room, I was listening to you, and I was thinking that that guy's doing it. He's doing a decent chop top. <laughs> then he came out on stage and went, oh my, oh fuck, it's chop top. <laughs> And, uh, you know, about literally not even more than a month after that, so maybe November uh, 99, early December, um, I got a call from Rob's manager at the time, a guy named Andy Gould. And he said, you know, Rob has just had this script greenlit at Universal. And greenlit, for all you non-movie people, means they said yes to the money. They're going to finance it. So uh, they greenlighted his, this script called House of a Thousand Corpses. And uh, and and Rob, you know, according to Andy, the manager, Rob, Rob wanted to know if I wanted to be in it. And I went, yeah, <laughs> sure. And uh, and then they sent over the script and I realized they said, you know, look at the part of Otis Driftwood. And I did. And I thought, you know, shit, that's a pretty big part. And um, that's what happened. That's how I got, you know, I met Rob at Igor Awards. Um, that's how I got sent the script. And um you know that's how that's why I'm sitting here now. Now, I want I want to know. I always wanted to know this as a huge fan of House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects. And we've never worked on a film together, but we need to one day, Bill. Sure. Uh, when you come on in character, how do you you know how do you get in the mind frame of a serial killer? 
Like, do you come out there? Are you in character 24 seven? How do you get worked up for that? Now you, you can't, when you, when you have two young girl daughters at home, you can't really be, you know, coming home with the, the, the mind <laughs> of a serial killer. It doesn't really Hitchhiker work. in the trunk. Yeah, right. Um, you know, what I, what I learned and, and every actor has a different philosophy of acting, I suppose, is what you're asking. Um, you know, I just uh, read the script a bunch of times and, uh, and, and do what I call an open-eyed meditation. Basically, I just sit with it and just think about it uh, quietly and just imagine, you know, who I am, what I'm doing, who the other people are, you know, basically everything I can do to make it real so that by the time I actually get on the set, um, I, I basically know who everybody is, what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to be, you know, what's happening in the scene, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's really what I do. Uh, you know, some people have asked me how I, how I play psychos. And uh, I, I guess the best advice to young psychos coming up, <laughs> if there are any out there, uh, and that is um, what I do is what I think when I'm, a, when I'm in character is, I'm the only sane one in the room. Ah, uh, that's how I feel sometimes. Yeah, because if you start playing a psycho, like, hey, I'm a psycho, you know, it looks, it looks, it looks like you're playing a psycho. Yeah, it doesn't brilliant. Look like you are a psycho, and uh, so that's what I do. I just, uh, I just try to make it real, and uh, and I don't do anything that is uh, exaggerated, you know, in in terms of the character. Now, obviously, Chop Top is over the top but is very consistent and has chop top has his own reality and uh never breaks the rules you know it's all very consistent otis very consistent doesn't break the rules um and that's really the way to do it that's a way to play any character whether it's a romantic comedy or horror or anything you just you know you figure out what the rules are and you don't break them um has a question. She wants to know, have you ever turned down a role because the character was too disturbing for you? You know, I think so. I think, I think if there, if there's uh, some, a couple of jobs I did just because of, it was a uh, violence against women for no particular reason. You know, sometimes it's just like, Hey, let's make a horror movie. Let's make it gritty. You know, whatever that means. And uh, we'll have a lot of, you know, We'll just kind of have gratuitous violence against women just because, you know, it's easier to write about for these people. I don't know, whatever it is. But there have been a couple of jobs like, you know, I'm not doing that. Um, not really big on Nazis. <laughs> so, you know, I have played a couple, but, um, you know, I'm not, you know, that's not kind of my cup of tea. So, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose so. There, there are a couple of things that go a little, you know, and also, I had, as I say, I have two daughters. And so... Uh, you know, and a wife, by the way. And, uh, you know, so there's also, you know, there's some things that I will do and some things that I won't. Did now, you ever, did you ever go to uh, the, the haunted Universal does their Halloween haunt and they did the house of the thousand corpses a maze and they had you in it about six times. Did you ever yeah. see this? Yes. The, the first time they did it, it was, uh, it was, Years ago, it was probably right I went after that one, yeah. That, so maybe it was that 2003, maybe. And uh, those were in the good old days where you could actually touch people. <laughs> you know, now it's all like everything is so litigious that uh, you can't really, you know, nobody can touch anybody. And anyway, uh, the reason I bring that up is because uh, Rob and I were, you know, we were on some, you know, Rob and Sherry and Sid, we were on some grand tour of House of a Thousand Corpses. And um, the, the first time we went through, we went through like the royal grouping and we went through and I was I turned around to say something. We were going from one room to another in the House of a Thousand Corpses. And I turned to Rob or Sherry and made some joke or said something. And then I turned around and this person jumped out at me and I went, ah, <laughs> and then I, I realized it was, it was Otis. <laughs> Otis scared me and I squealed like a, you know, a wonderful. Schoolgirl squeal, but anyway. So, uh, but then, uh, then uh, Rob and I, we, we got a little, you know, got a little rambunctious, a little tired of the the tour, and we ended up. Um, I had a couple of masks. I had a dog mask and some other mask, and we put masks on, 
and we lifted up. Uh, there were, I guess it was like a tent or something. Is we we actually crawled underneath the, the tent flap and got into the House of a Thousand Corpses maze and started and grabbing, jumping out and grabbing people. Oh, that's and wonderful! So much fun. I, I've never. I really. I think that's the most fun I've ever had. So people so got frightened by Bill Mosley and Rob Zombie and had no idea that it was <laughs> no there. idea because we were in that's fantastic. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. Hey, Bill, next time you, if you enjoy grabbing people, next time when I come down there to L.A., we'll go out and grab some people up. <laughs> well, right. now, now with social distancing, I don't know how, how that's going to work. But. <laughs> uh, a couple of people on here was asking about, we, will there ever be another Firefly movie? Let me throw something out here. All y'all guys asking about, will Bill do this movie, Bill do that movie? The big thing to stop movies from getting made, as Bill said, is is having budgets. Yeah. And you know, go out and fund. You know, if all the horror fans pulled their money together, they could they could crowdfund a, a, a great some great movies. Yeah. But we all have to be on these studios. Like yeah. I'm, I'm pissed that you're not on a Netflix show because there's so much missed opportunity that. Companies like Netflix and Amazon can have by having a horror legend in those shows that they're putting. Totally agree. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's got to be, you, you got to have a budget. Uh, you know, that's important. Uh, it's got to be union. That's important. Um, and, uh, it, you know, you have to own your characters. That's important. Uh, you know, there's some, there's some basic rules, but, um, yeah, I mean, our job is to get the job. So, uh, you know, come on. And start demanding. If you see, if, and this is just me talking, this ain't Bill talking. This is, if if you on social media and you see, hey, they're doing a new movie like this, this, and this, or this director's attached to this film, tag them. Tag the director and be like, hey, I demand Bill Mosley be in this movie. Yeah. You know? it is. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. I love to see you work with Jordan Peele. I think that would be an amazing combination. Jordan's a very talented director and producer. Oh, yeah. No, man, hey, I, I love Get Out. I, hey, I saw that a couple times. Hey, hey Bill, Bill have you, you ever played at a convention? Have you, Has your band ever played at a convention? I've just no. never I, – I, now i got to find your music. I know you've been playing forever. I'd love to hear your stuff. Yeah, most of it is just, you know, kind of for fun. Uh, you know, I got together with uh, uh, the world's greatest guitar player, Buckethead, uh, probably back in 1990. I did a play here in Los Angeles called uh, Timothy and Charlie about uh, the last. Uh, uh, there was historically one night where Timothy Leary and Charles Manson were side by side in solitary confinement in San Quentin prison in california and uh and so this play basically starts you know it's and i played timothy leary and wow. uh, my buddy gil gale played uh, charlie manson and um it's a really cool play two act play a lot of you know yelling and you know posturing and long long monologues and um anyway uh one of gil's friends was buckethead and buckethead uh was a big chop top fan Awesome. And came to the show, uh, one of our performances, and then uh, came backstage. Uh, I, I got introduced to him. I didn't know anything about Buckethead, um, but he said that he was doing music and wanted to, wanted me to go off on some music he'd made. And I thought, you know, it sounds good. Gil said he's a good guy. So I uh, took my bongo drums and drove down, you know, the next day or two to uh, Santa Monica to some apartment where... There was a bunch of equipment set up and uh, Buckethead started playing this crazy guitar and I started making stuff up to it and uh, it's Chop Top and Buckethead got so excited about it that um, he invited me to play on an album called Giant Robot, which wow. was at the time, I think it was a Sony record way, way back when. And, um, and so he flew me to, um, he flew me to New York to record a couple of songs on Giant Robot. And he wanted me to play, he wanted me to go off as Chop Top on Giant Robot. So I said, okay, that's great. And, he's, and I just thought, I thought before I got on the plane, I thought, you know, I better call my buddy, my old college buddy, who's now a professor of copyright law at uh, Loyola Marymount here in Los Angeles. 
Jay Doherty. So I called him up and I said, hey, Jay, I'm about to go to New York and go off a job top. Um, you know, what do you think about that? And he said, well, you don't know the character, do you? And I said, no, it's, you know, Canon Film Zones. And he said, well, uh, you know, I don't know if they'd come after you, but I, I would come up with a different character. You know, and I went, huh. And I hung up the phone. I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> that's my character. I what do you mean come up with a different character. <laughs> anyway, so I uh, so I was, you know, flying the next day. I got on a plane to New York and I'm on in the air and I'm thinking, you know, geez, what's going to happen when I get to New York? And Buckethead says, OK, go off his chop top. And I go, well, I can't go off his chop top. Uh, so I thought I'd better come up with a different character in, you know, in that time between flying from one one coast to the next. And uh, so I came up with this idea. I had this idea about, um, uh, sh I thought about a scarecrow. I thought about a uh, scarecrow, scare. So I came up with the word shoe, like shoe. And instead of crow, I just thought bird. So I came up with this character called shoe bird. You know, the shoe bird, the scarecrow. That was going to be my chop top substitute. So I got to, uh, I, you know, I got to New York. I got to the hotel. Buckethead came in after a hard day of working with Bill Laswell in uh, at his studio in, in Brooklyn. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, ready to go. And I said, well, yeah, yeah except uh, I can't really, I can't do Chop Top. And all of a sudden, Buckethead's face literally darkened. I mean, he was, he just went into a very dark place and, uh, and I just thought, oh, my God, there goes my rock and roll career. And I said, well, but I came up with this other idea. And he goes, what? I said, well, uh, <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, this scarecrow, I, I call him shoe bird, like shoe bird. <laughs> and Bucket is just like stewing. And I'm just thinking, oh, I'm screwed. And then, uh, and then finally Buckethead goes, well, I got a name. And I go, well, what? He goes, Nah. And I go, oh, no, no, what? He goes, nah. I go, what? <laughs> Come on, man. My whole life is involved. And uh, he said, onions. I said, onion? Onions, the scarecrow? He thought, that's cool, man. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, onions was born. Thank God. You know, we were teetering on the edge there, but uh, onions. And the next day we went to... Uh, Bill Laswell studio and, and, and Buckethead had already laid down uh, what became Onions Unleashed. And, uh, and I just started making stuff up. You know, hey, kids, Onions here, and we're going to have a real good time, <laughs> you know, and just doing this Onions thing. And, um, and then, uh, you know, Bill Laswell was so excited about it. He wanted me to do I Come in Peace. So I do kind of a radio announcer talking about, you know, this giant, you know, Godzilla-like bucket head coming into town and everything. So uh, it worked out. Uh, it worked out. But, man, I was uh, really uh, on, on the verge there. Corn bugs, which is what we basically evolved into, lasted about uh, 10, maybe 15 years. Well, that was a long time. And then um, uh, from there, um, I moved on to uh, work with a guy named Ronnie Sharon, from a band called Stolen Babies. Ronnie's twin brother, Gil, is the drummer for Marilyn Manson. Wow. Uh, and Ronnie, uh, Ronnie was played with Tool. And so we had we formed a band called uh, Spider Mountain and uh, put out a CD. And then uh, really about a couple of years ago, I uh, was bugging my old buddy, uh, Phil Anselmo. <laughs> Phil. Um, and I, I kept, you know, Phil is a big horror fan. I'd interviewed him for some... Uh, website called uh, Artist Direct, where a, a musician is supposed to interview an actor. But turns out Phil knew a lot more about music and horror than I did. So I basically just sat there and got schooled. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, I I, uh, I kept bugging Phil, saying, you know, we should you know do a you know do an you know work together. I think is the term. And um, and it's kind of funny. It's kind of like asking. Paul McCartney to play bass in your garage band, you know, oh, come <laughs> on, that'd be fun. But anyway, you know, one time I, I bugged Phil, not, you know, I wasn't incessant and I wasn't, you know, bad about it. And uh, I said, yeah, come on. He said, well, I got four days, you know, in February. And if you can get down here, maybe we'll, you know, take a look at something. So 
I cashed in some air miles. I flew to New Orleans from Los Angeles, wow. rented a car, drove over Lake Pontchartrain, <laughs> found Phil in the woods in his house, and uh, and we cranked out uh, what is called uh, Bill and Phil Songs of Darkness and Despair, which is an uh, EP. It, it. So it's like six songs. Uh, we cranked them out in a couple of days. Uh, Phil had a lot of his, you know, studio musicians from King Parrot and Super Joint Ritual and all kinds of great guys, uh, you know, add music to it. Uh, and it came out pretty good. Uh, if you go on to YouTube and look up Bill and Phil with an ampersand, Bill and Phil, um, there's a great, uh, they even did a claymation video for something called Dirty Eye, which is pretty cool. So, um, you know, still crank it away. I, uh, you know, I, I love music, you know, because, uh, again, that goes back to Chop Top, you know. Music is my life. <laughs> <laughs> I still wanted to know, uh, in your opinion, Bill, who's more sadistic, Otis or Chop Top? That's a good question. I really have never even <laughs> thought about it. Um, well, I'm just trying to, you know, go by their actions. I mean, Otis, you could think Otis is sadistic, especially at the end of Three from Hell. Uh, but uh, no, that's that's just justice. Um, and uh, making Fish Boy was pretty sadistic, chopping up poor uh, Rain Wilson. Uh, but that was just, uh, that was in the service of art. Uh, Chop Top, let's see here. Uh, I think Chop Top is a little more sadistic, especially the way he was working uh, working the straight razor on poor Stretch. <laughs> you know, I think that's, I'd have to go with Chop Top. But Otis kept, the, what was it, three or four cheerleaders in the shed, you know? Well, you know, but that was really because Otis needed, uh, needed to break out of his, uh, you know, he was kind of uh, in this frozen place. Uh, you know, it was a total block. And uh, sometimes you need you know, a couple of cheerleaders to uh, you know help you get out of a total block. I totally understand that. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, Chris says he teaches a special education and art class. And do you have any advice to students on how to be creative and finding a path to a successful career? I, I don't really have any advice because I think the advice that I might give might not be good advice. Uh, for me, it was a total, it really, it really feels like uh, there's got to be a higher power, a destiny of some kind, because I don't know how I got from where I was, you know, in school, um, you know, which was like hitting, hitting like a joint going, you know, wouldn't it be great to uh, be in a horror movie? You know, I mean, that was kind of where I was. And, uh, you know, to get from there to here, uh, it took a lot of luck, I think. Uh, you know, I didn't really do my acting career, um, you know, the uh, the orthodox way. That's, you know, you go to acting school and, you know, you do summer stock and you do plays and, you know, you get an agent and you go to parties and you send out pictures and resumes and you, you know, you really, there's a, there's a real, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, what I ended up doing was making a short film called The Texas Chainsaw Manicure. <laughs> it was uh, set in a beauty parlor in, in Staten Island, as it turns out. Um, and I ended up, uh, it's like a woman goes to a beauty parlor. She gets her, you know, hair done. She's sitting under the dryer and she goes, I think I'll have a manicure. And the, uh, the beautician calls to the back of the shop, manicure. And you hear this chainsaw rev to life. And uh, the steel door, of course, good old steel door, slides open. And out comes Leatherface from the back of the shop. And he comes over and here's this poor lady sitting down with her with a you know dryer on her head. And uh, he comes over and starts, you know, sawing on her fingers. She's screaming and and um, and then she passes out and they kind of revive her and she goes, oh, 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 oh. Oh. and she's got a <laughs> fabulous manicure. And uh, she goes out to show her husband in the truck. And of course that was me. That was my I gave myself a cameo as the hitchhiker and I had my wine mark on my face and you know the whole you know hitchhiker outfit I'd even gone as far as to uh have someone go to the butcher and get some uh, head sheets some real head sheets oh my God. which is not actually very cinematically exciting it's kind of <laughs> like 
the same color of baloney. It just, you know, it doesn't have a lot of exciting, like an ear sticking out or a schnoz. But it's like, it's, it's everything. It's, you know, gelatin from your eyeballs and lips and tongue and testicles, whatever it is, it's all ground up in there. And, um, and anyway, so she gets in the car and goes, look, honey, I got the best manicure ever. And I go, hey, that's great, honey. Ooh, we should celebrate with some head cheese. <laughs> I started licking the head cheese. Oh. Really, really was a bad idea. Uh, but um, I was working at the time as a writer for, um, uh, I was a freelance writer in New York. And one of my steady gigs was uh, Omni Magazine, O-M-N-I, an old science, science fiction magazine put out by penthouse actually and um they sent me omni sent me to uh los angeles to cover the making of 2010 the space odyssey sequel it's a wow. junket, junket so they fly you out they put you out they take you to the set you're supposed to write good things about them and you know that helps you know, get more people to buy tickets so i was on this junket and i brought along the manicure with me because i was trying to sell it nobody wanted it Saturday Night Live, Fridays, nobody wanted it for one reason or another. It was five minutes, no stars, you know, it was already, it was a parody of a horror movie, whatever it was, nobody wanted it. So I brought it along with me, and uh, when I came out to L.A., I had uh, an old high school buddy who was already a hot young screenwriter. He and his partner had written uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Holy cow. And, uh, so I went out to his house for dinner when I was in town. And I brought along the manicure. And after dinner, I, you know, we, he had a VHS. That was back in the VHS days. So he had a machine. He popped in the manicure. And uh, we watched it. And he said, oh, my God, I love this. And he said, you know, right now, my partner and I are working at Paramount Pictures. This was back in 1984. They were at Paramount Pictures across the hall from Toby Hooper, mm. who was there working uh, working up on uh, Poltergeist. Poltergeist. And so he said, um, my friend said, look, if you want, um, I can give me this tape, you know, leave a copy and I'll walk it into Toby. And uh, I said, you know, why not? And so I gave him a copy of the tape. He walked it across the hall. Toby popped it into his VHS player, watched it, loved it, mm -hmm. uh, called in his producing partner, a guy named Steven Spielberg. Holy he watched cow. it. He loved it. And they especially loved my performances, Chopped, my 20 seconds. And um, my buddy also got me Toby's home number. Uh, he, which he, you know, to, don't tell you, don't tell him where he got it. And uh, I called him up at about 10 days later after I'd gone back to New York. And uh, Toby, um, you know, Toby answered the phone, which I learned was a, a big uh, miracle. And uh, and I he, he said hello. I said. He told me this it's it's Bill Mosley. Who? I said, oh, yeah, I'm the one that did the um, I did the manicure, the chainsaw manicure. He goes, oh, oh hell yeah, Bill, I love the manicure. I said, oh great, I'm really glad to hear that. And he goes, yeah, now who who played the hitchhiker character? And I said, well, uh, uh, that was me. He goes, well, geez, if I ever do a sequel, I'll keep you in mind. And I went, great, that's awesome. And um, you know, he said to stay in touch. I sent him a postcard. I think I never heard from him for two years. After that, and uh, then in early 1986, I got a call one night in New York uh, from somebody named Kit Carson, who was the screenwriter of Chainsaw 2. And he said, uh, you know, hi, is this Bill Mosley? Yes. Well, where should I send a copy of Chainsaw 2 script? And I went, whoa. Uh -huh. you know, I was thinking, like, who, who is this really? Don't goof on me. And uh, but I gave him my address. It came by mail. I read it. It was awesome. I was told to look at the part of Chop Top or Plate Head, whatever the character was called. Yeah. And um, and then the next thing I heard was I got a call from Canon Films saying, do you have an agent or do you want to negotiate your own contract? Wow. And it was like, what the hell is going on? So, you know, I, I had met an agent at a Christmas party. I called her up. She was happy to negotiate the contract. And, um, and she said, uh, you know, at the, at the time I was working, I was probably making 300 a week as a freelance writer at most. And uh, she she called me back after talking to Canon Films. She said, well, they really want you to play this character Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw 2. And I was like, wow, that's insane. She said, but, you know, bad news is they're only going to pay you minimum, SAG minimum. I went, well, geez, how much is that? She said, well, I don't know. I think it's like 1600 a week. I was like, what? 1600 a week? That's like, 
that's like five months, you know, earnings for, the, for me. I said, well, I, I think I can handle that. And she said, Wonderful. Yeah, there's, there's one, one other thing. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, you know, you've got this prosthetic in your head, this plate. So they want you to shave your head. I went, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> she said, so I told him you were a working actor and that, um, you know, if you shaved your head, you wouldn't get work for six months. So they've agreed to pay you five thousand dollars to shave your head. <laughs> like, oh my God, is that that's bad news? Wait a minute. So, uh, that was that was my big. That's how I got into show business. I don't know. That's a long answer for the professor there, but uh, I don't know, man. It just uh, I, I I I think that's a lot more luck than anything else. Except make your own movie, I guess, and you know, make a YouTube channel and put your own stuff up. Now. Bill, you, you talked about how you take a creative liberties in different roles you had. Was any of the lines from Devil's Rejects or House of a Thousand Corpses, did you have live everything or did, did Rob make it go by the script totally? You know, uh, Devil, uh, House of a Thousand Corpses was Rob's first feature. Um, and so we were pretty, uh, I, I stayed pretty much word for word um, in terms of uh, that that Otis um, Devil's Rejects, you know, he he seemed to be a little more relaxed around us all. We'd work together, um, so I do remember one particular uh, ad lib, and that was uh, when I'm taking Banjo and Sullivan to uh, the old the abandoned chicken farm to uh, you know dig up the guns, quote unquote, you know, and we get to this uh, old this dusty place and. Uh, and the two guys get out of the truck and we're walking uh, to the, you know, to the, well, basically the kill site. And, um, and I've got a gun on both of them. And, um, and Rob had not written anything between the truck and where we actually started to fight. And uh, it was a long walk. We needed something there. So he said, uh, he said to me, um, why don't you, why don't you uh, say, uh, you know, uh, is that your wife's pussy stink on my gun? So I said, what? <laughs> you know, referring back to our, you know, happy time in the Kahiki Pops Motel. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, go ahead and say it. I went, okay. So I said, uh, hey, Hoss, is that, your wife's, is that your wife's pussy stink on my gun? And then I added, hope it don't rust the barrel. <laughs> You know, and that, you know, that got Rob's seal of approval. <laughs> and then, so that was, that was my big ad lib, I think. Uh, what about in uh, Repo, the genetic opera? Gina had asked, did you take any creative liberties with your character there? Yeah, I mean, creative liberties, it was interesting because Repo, we had recorded ahead of time. Um, so we already had the soundtrack. Um, which, which I learned doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you don't just lip sync like, Hey, how are you? Uh, you know, what you do is you speak, but you're not being mic'd and it's basically already been recorded. Um, but, um, the liberties I took, um, one of the things was that we had a really good, um, uh, Canadian Toronto based, uh, dance instructor. What is that called? A choreographer choreographer thank you very much yeah and uh, and she and i could see she was doing all these kind of you know making all the all the other cast members do these mambo steps and really you know everybody was timed and doing all this stuff and i i'm not that guy i'm like two left feet so i said you know the one one of the creative liberties was i asked darren i said you know maybe can, can my character be the guy that's out of step and he said yeah sure so that was like whew. Because you know, if I had you know had to figure out a step, step, step back, turns, you know, all that stuff, uh, that would have freaked me out. Um, but you know, I think I think basically um, one of the ad libs was just how how well uh, Ogre and I got along. We got along. We had a real bromance on the set. We were great buddies. Uh, so we got along really well there. So that was kind of I, I suppose an improv in the sense of you know somehow. You know, we didn't like each other as characters, but we got along really well. We we and we both loved Paul Sorbino, <laughs> you know, our dad Rocky Largo, and uh, so that was also. You know, so there was a lot of kind of undercurrents, um, 
But, uh, you know, again, when it's already recorded, uh, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. I, when I look at the characters and the stuff you played from Chop Top, I mean, you and, and definitely the zombie movies, you probably have the best quotable lines of any actor in horror film history. I would definitely have to say that in my opinion. Well, yeah, I've been I've been lucky. <laughs> I love the the whole the devil's real, you know, holy this holy we got we us alive one. I mean, it's crazy. That that rigs of Rob though. That was Rob that wrote that one, didn't he? Oh, Rob wrote, wrote all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't yeah. think I, I don't. As I say, I didn't really do much improvising in um, in the house, especially in the House of a Thousand Corpses. What about Dead Air? It seems like you you made up a lot of stuff in Dead Air. Not really. Really, uh, Dead Air was um, Ronnie Yesko or Ronnie Yakel, who was yeah. the um, uh, screenwriter, and he did a great job. It's very good. I so thought was that great. was all you. I totally thought that. Was oh really no! But I had to. I had. I had to work so hard because I. I showed up on that job, and I got to say, for the young actor, I. I kind of showed up on the job. I thought, you know, I'm. I'm. I'm hot shit, and um, I don't need to work that hard. Whoa! And uh, and so I, I. Boy, and you know, Corbin Burnson is a. You know, was our director, and uh, and he's a TV guy. You know, for uh, years on LA Law and burn notice or whatever it is, uh, psycho, psych, uh, you know, so he's done a lot of TV stuff and TV, they, you basically cram it every day, you know, just like get the line, cram the line, cram the line. And I don't come from that. I come from like, you know, you know, improv and man, I've got to feel it. <laughs> well, it was like one world meeting another. And, wow. um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I I had to work really hard. I mean, I did not show up completely prepared for that. And uh, to the point where there were actually some scenes where the lines, uh, which had to be, you know, the, the, the copy had to, the print had to be blown up a little bit. And then they were taped to uh, Apple boxes, which were right, you know, if there was a close up, the Apple box is right here. You know, well, uh, if there's a close up, the Apple box, well, it's, uh, you know, Apple box right next to the camera, but off camera. And, um, you know, with my lines on it, because I mean, on some, on some of those, because there was a lot to say. And I, and as I say, I wasn't really that prepared. Uh, but eventually, you know, I mean, just by, you know, dint of hard work, um, you know, we got all that down and it made it look very smooth, <laughs> which I was struggling. It was wow. interesting too, because um, we did, we shot about, you know, if it was if the script was 110 pages, we shot the first 90 pages, um, you know, in 10 days. You know, we just banged it out. We had 10 days. The reason we had 10 days is because uh, Corbin had to go to back to Vancouver to continue shooting his show Psych. So, you know, we were like pressing like, you know, pages and pages. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. And so after 10 days of doing this incredibly insane around the clock work, then we stopped and we didn't resume for, I think it, I think it was almost six months. Wow. And so then, you know, and I had like a little Van Dyke thing. So I had to re regrow that. And so, and then, you know, it's so weird to be in a, in an intense situation like that and then find, and then you're cut loose and then you wait for six months and then you try to, you know, recall what it was like and get back into it. But um, I think it turned out to be a pretty good little movie. I, I, it's one of those, I, know, like, I, I, thought, I always was, turn people onto that movie and people really like it. Yeah. And now what do you watch when you're not thinking or watching about horror stuff? What kind of movies are well, TV? You know, during, during the quarantine here, I have uh, watched all 20 episodes of, uh, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, yeah, with Darren right. McGavin, which is so great. Yeah, and I just love that. And, you know, that's what I was doing. Uh, my wife and daughter were 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 off on uh, her family ranch in Mexico, so I was home for alone for about uh, about three weeks. And my routine included, you know, for lunch I would watch an episode of uh, Three Stooges, you know, the Curly episodes. And uh, and at night I would watch an episode of uh, Night Stalker, 
Um, so uh, also, you know, what I've gotten into lately is, or I've revisited, there's a wonderful uh, Indian director named Satyajit Ray, uh, S-A-T-Y-A-J-I-T, R-A-Y, and uh, he has, he's famous for something called the Apu Trilogy, A-P-U, uh, three movies um, about a kid growing up in rural uh, India in the 50s. That's black and three black and white movies are beautiful. Uh, I've gotten into those, um, gotten into uh, Stalker um, by the same director, the same Russian director uh, who directed uh Andrei Rublev, my favorite movie, A-N-D-R-E-I, Rublev, R-U-B-L-E-V, in a wonderful Russian cinema. Tarkovsky is his last name, the director. Uh, so I've been, you know, I've been, you know, I haven't been completely going monster, but I, but I have been you know, filling a lot of the holes in my horror filmography. I, you know, I watched Night of the Comet, which I'd never seen before. I got my sad card in that. Chopping Mall, <laughs> you uh, know, you know, checking it out. Um, Fright Night, I hadn't seen. You know, really? A lot of these. Yeah. The original, never, I, oh my God, that's a great one. I know. You know, what, you know what movie I gave you on Devil's Reject? Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Really? I, 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 you were, we were talking, and I, I put it in your dressing room. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I had seen those. I mean, I'd seen the old Dawn of the Dead, the new one. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but this is a, this has been a great time. I mean, for me, you know, in terms of, you know, no one wants a quarantine, no one wants a killer virus, but, uh, at the same time, oh, and I, I you know, I watched, uh, what, what is it called? Contagion. <laughs> oh my God. That's That's really scary. Scary. The scary. And, and really, I mean, it's amazing how, cl how close to this reality that movie was, you know, yeah. four years ago or 10 years ago. And if you really want to see something creepy, there is a, I think it's Denzel Washington movie called Siege mm -hmm. um, with Chris Willis. And it, that was pre 9 11. Nice. It, it kind of hit on all the wow. terrorism stuff and a lot of things. Uh, I saw, I saw two know? other really, uh, two cool, one, one Korean movie called The Wailing, W A I L I N. I've heard of that. Oh, fucking good. And then uh, also, there's a Japanese movie called uh, "Battle the Battleship Island," uh, which is very cool. I don't know if it's a Japanese movie. Yeah, I think it's actually a Korean movie set in Japan in World War II. The Battleship Island. Uh, that is really cool. Hey, can um, we get uh, Texas Chainsaw uh, Manicure on YouTube or anything? Is no, there a place to see that? The only time I ever did anything with it was, um, I think, on one of Toby's uh, Masters of Horror uh, DVDs. I think there might be, I think the manicure got up on that. But um, wow. I never really did anything with the manicure because I never owned the rights to the songs. I never made, like, I, you know, I'm the producer, too, so I should have done that. But I never got the clearances for there's a Clifton Chenier song you know uh, what else a Kinky Friedman song uh, you know not you know nothing too elaborate in five minutes but uh, I had never done that and I was paranoid because I didn't want to get arrested I don't I don't know what I thought would happen they'd drag me to jail <laughs> I guess so but it's so it's still in my desk I mean you know I could take it out and show you but it looked like just any <laughs> other any other TV or DVD. Uh, do you do much reading, Bill? I do, yeah. What do you like to read? Um, I do like to read, um, well, my favorite book is Moby Dick. Huh? The unabridged, you know, the whole thing. I, I love Moby Dick. I, I, I don't know, to me it's, well. And I love reading, I've been revisiting uh, some Jack Kerouac. Uh, I'm not a real, I don't really know much about contemporary authors, and I probably should. My wife is a big contemporary author reader, um, but that's what I like to do. I like to do uh, New York Times crossword puzzles just to kind of keep the the, the gray matter moving. And uh, you know what I've gotten into in the last year is um, word jumble. I don't know, in, in the LA Times, we have like a little word jumble. It's like a little cartoon with a bunch of words to jumble, and then there's a get to figure out the caption that that's been, I don't know, for some reason I'm really into that. 
Yeah, anytime you want us to, anytime you want to get somebody to get a look at that Texas Chainsaw Manicure, you can let us. We do a live feed and uh, you know put it together or something like that. We should sure. do a screening at Mad Monster in October. Uh, we should show Happy it. To. It's, and it's really good. I did a screening. You know what I did was I compiled a bunch of stuff. Uh, it was like into about a 15 minute little reel for uh, one of Phil Anselmo's, you know, horror music shows in uh, Austin, Texas, about five or six years ago. Uh, so I have like, like a little, a nice little compilation, uh, including Chop Top singing Itsy Bitsy Spider. And Holy shit, I'd I love to see that. There's actually, uh, you know, and then there's a really cool uh, Spider Mountain song, uh, like a music video. Uh, you know, so there's a, it's a cool little thing, 15 minutes, you know, so the fans won't get too overwhelmed. <laughs> let's do that. Let, let's yeah. make that happen, yeah. Sergeant. All right. And, and Bill, Mark's got a band, so if y'all want to jam out one time at the, at, the, at, the, at the party, you know, let us know. Yeah. We'll get Mark up there. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, the reason I, uh, you know, first of all, I have, I have stage fright, so that's probably the first reason. The second reason is, you know, by the end of these, uh, the, the convention days, I'm kind of beat. Yeah. So, you know, my interest is getting to the room and, you know. That's the way I feel Fucking, you know, kicking off my shoes and, you know, looking out the window or whatever else. So, you know, but, you know, I, I'm trying new things. <laughs> so you never know, man. As, uh, you've been so, you know, we've been on here for a little over an hour. You've been so generous to us with your time, but we definitely. All right. Really I been a pleasure. That. Any last words? Any last words? I don't know. Stay you safe, know. you know. It better be some brilliant Mark Twain shit too, Bill. Brilliant Mark Twain shit. Well, let me let me. Well, I, I will I will close this by by showing you the coat hanger, which is also in my closet with everything else. Badass. Yes. I, I, it's the only thing that's apropos to be in his closet. <laughs> I bet you. I bet you got somebody tied up in that closet. <laughs> I'd love to think that. <sighs> well, I just had this. I have this box. Had this box of stuff, and it's so funny because I have I have these. These are my tidy whities. Holy uh, shit! Tight. <laughs> well, no, no, they're they're clean. Oh, sorry. These tidy whities have been in Rogue River. They've been in. Um, they were in Three from Hell. That's what I. That's what Otis wore. I mean, these tidy whities have been in a lot of movies. So they're. But you wouldn't know it. You would look at that and go, you know, at a yard sale, going, oh. Jesus, man. Whenever I'd work with yeah. Sid Haig, I'd make him wear my watch. So he wears my watch in every movie yeah. I've worked with. It's like, it's like sending something to the moon. <laughs> uh, this is the, the this is the original chop top coat hanger. You can see the nice bend there at the bottom. Perfect. It's kind of silver. And uh, that is from Chainsaw 2. And then finally, you know what I do have too? I, I have an I have an elf, of course, in the box. Uh, oh yeah, I have uh, I had this straight razor that Chop Top used to uh, cut his own throat. Like, hey, look, look at my face. <laughs> and it's really cool because it's kind of you know, fortunately, it's a, a dull blade, so <laughs> like killing me. Uh, but I was also looking. Maybe it's in another box somewhere else. I think it is. But I also have my uh, my teeth, my chop top teeth. Oh my god! And you know what I have? And I'm going to show you. And I may never do this again. But this is the lighter that I use to light the coat hanger. Oh, that's and right. It still has fuel. Whoa! That's wonderful. That's, that's 30 years ago, and there's a, like a little chop top uh, bone necklace that uh, actually, you know, who made this was uh, Tony Hooper, wow, uh, Toby's, wow. Toby's son, who uh, also did the uh, the All American Massacre. But he was on the set, and he made these this cool little necklace out of teeth and beads. It's wonderful. Yeah, so it's all here in my closet. I don't know what's up with the closet thing, but uh, oh, it's a place to store stuff. Yeah. You got some money to call the Bill. 
Wonderful spending time with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Love, love Mad Monster. Thank you, everybody that's uh, that showed up and um, you know that that sat through this. Uh, God, it's almost an hour and twenty minutes. So wow. sorry about that, everybody. That's great. But there, my show and tell is done, and um, I will see you. I guess in Phoenix, right? Yep. 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 October. All right. You okay. take care, Bill. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> I'll figure. I'll figure this out. You know, sometime. There we are. All right, guys. I don't know how to get out of here, but I think I'm just going to hit the little X, right?